my fellow countrymen. The Lord be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, I come to you tonight because by all accounts our country is in serious trouble. I beg you, Father, to send down the Holy Spirit to guide and protect this present government of ours. They seem to have lost their way and need your holy guidance. Oh, Father, bless the little children of the land, the old, the sick, and the disabled. Give them the help and strength they need to survive at this juncture in their lives. I plead with you, Father, because you are the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Tonight I quote from Shirak chapter 32, 33, verses 23 to 24, and verses 1 to 6. If you fear the Lord, you will accept his correction. He will bless those who get up early in the morning to pray, study his law, and you will master it, unless you are insincere about it, in which case you will fail. If you fear the Lord, you will know what right is, and you will be famous for your fairness. Sinners have no use for correction and will interpret the law to suit themselves. Sensible people will consider every opinion, but arrogant people will let nothing stand in their way. Never do anything without thinking it through. And once you have done some something, don't look back and wish you had done something else. Don't take account of any action that is dangerous and don't make the same mistake twice. Don't be too sure of yourself. Even when the way looks easy, always watch where you are going. Whatever you do, be careful. This is in keeping the Lord's command. Believing in the law means keeping the Lord's command. If you trust the Lord, you cannot lose. No evil will ever come to a person who fears the Lord. However often danger comes, the Lord will come to his rescue. A person who has no use for the law doesn't have good sense. And anyone who is insincere about it is going to be tossed about like a boat in a storm. If you are wise, you will believe in the law. You will find it as reliable as the sacred lots. Prepare what you are going to say and people will listen to you. Use what you have learned before you start talking. A foolish person's mind works like a cartwheel, going round and round in circles. A, a sarcastic friend is like a wild horse that neighs, no matter who tries to ride him. Before I go into my nitty-gritty of my social comment, let me say to the Prime Minister that I was happy to hear what Frank Myers had to say in regards to the comment he made about nursing nurses having to resign and to reapply in order to go to the Owen King Hospital to work. Sir, this is preposterous and unlawful. I tell you this because I have a degree in industrial relations and a diploma in labor studies and industrial relations. Therefore, I, study labor, I studied labor law and under the, the ILO rules and regulations, you are heading down a slippery slope if and when the unions take you on. In my view, no nurse should resign and reapply. We need to think this out and stop making ourselves look stupid to, our, to the outside world. I worked hard for this government to get into office and I'm somewhat dismayed by its action and blatant disregard for people of this country. This is uncalled for. Please, sir, look before you leap. Not to be the horse who have to put on blinkers in order that the jockey can ride you properly. Now, to the thrust of my social comments, brothers and sisters. Tonight I come to you with a heavy heart because our government have given a visa-free waiver to Chinese coming to St. Lucia. Not only that, I did not hear them saying the same for Taiwanese coming to St. Lucia, a country that has helped us so much and still continuing to do so. Let me make it blunt and clear that I'm not happy with what is happening in Venezuela. But to put visa restrictions on a close friend who have helped us so much in the past is an outright diabolical disgrace. Civil society, as we as St. Lucians, must stand up and say to our government to reconsider because Chinese are already entering our pristine country. If the media reports are correct, the question I now ask is whether will, whether will St. Lucians get free visa waiver to China? Visa-free waiver, in my view, should be reciprocal. In the passage I chose tonight, let me extract a few lines that our government should take notice of, and that is, sensible people will consider every opinion, 
but arrogant people will let nothing stand in their way. Never do anything without thinking it through. And once you have done something, don't look back and wish you had done something else. Don't take a course of action that is dangerous and don't make the same mistake twice. This coming from the Holy Book, I hope the Prime Minister and his cabinet will take this advice in a serious manner because they are words of wisdom. However, what caught my eye was the saying that a foolish person's mind works like a cartwheel going round and round in circles. A sarcastic friend is like a wild horse that neighs no matter who tries to ride him. I picked that out because a good friend told me a few days ago that a particular leader is like a big strong horse who can run but he needs a good jockey and at present this one has a terrible jockey. I had to laugh because I can see where they were heading. Tonight I feel St. Lucia, St. Lucia's pain and anguish because of this, of this visa free entry to the Chinese nation. We must stand firm and try to rescind this decision because of what is taking place around the world as far as the Chinese are concerned. St. Lucia, in my view, needs a strong civil society group or a third party no-nonsense party because the youth of this country is crying out in the wilderness for this to happen. I now come to something of importance and therefore I want to apologize to those listening tonight for once again highlighting China's belligerence and utter callousness in the manner it has behaved over the last two decades towards our diplomatic friend Taiwan. What infuriates me is that the world leaders have failed to digest that China is a threat not only to Taiwan, but to the whole world. This is why even though I may not be a Trump supporter, I do understand his dislike of China's economic policies and military aggressiveness. Trump is of the view that China wants to have their cake and eat it, and that their dishonesty at complying with the World Trade Organization's rules and regulations is blatant for all to see. They now seem to push their weight about in an aggressive manner. Many world leaders seem more interested in China's economic value to them at this moment in time instead of looking ahead and doing everything in their power to prevent a third world war, which will be of China's making. I would like to point out to those leaders who are thinking of diplomatic relations with China to remember that at present, the biggest debtors to Taiwan are now China followed by the United States. What this tells us is that Taiwan's money situation is sound and they are not in debt. Their balance of payment is healthy. This is the sort of information we should look to before jumping on the China bandwagon and breaking diplomatic relations with Taiwan or allowing Chinese in this country. Many world leaders who appease China are taking more of their own pockets and close friends as we saw in Santo Domingo. China made millionaires of politicians and now want to plunder the country's resources. What amazes me is that the government was not concerned about the 72 Taiwanese firms that have roots on the island. And they have been friends with Taiwan for over 70 odd years. China is prepared to buy its way into countries because they want to control these countries to the benefit of China. What is amazing is that these political leaders who think only of their pockets, turn a blind eye because of they, they, get, they are kicked out of government. If they're kicked out, they will have become rich individuals. Therefore, I say openly tonight that I welcome a debate with T.O.R. King about his credentials. Even the new Chinese representative, Mr. Louis, as to his objective in St. Lucia, I ask him a serious question. Has he come to insult us as to why we broke diplomatic relations with China in 2006? And therefore, that is why the government has given visa-free waiver to his country and not Venezuela because of his aggressiveness. I want to make it clear to our government and to Mr. Louis that on the issue of Taiwan independence, I pull no punches and will do everything in my power to uphold their right to be a free country. So, your leader, Xi Jinping, thinks that China has a mandate to rule the world and that he has the wherewithal to make it happen. That is what is behind China's attitude and belligerence. And not only that, 
China is interested in being the number one country in the world, both economically and military. But they want to, to be such a dominant force that the majority of the world will bow to them. They don't mind being the biggest colonizers of all time, if that is what it takes. Already they want to colonize Africa, while the world seems unperturbed as to what is going on, especially the United Nations, who pander to their whims and fancies, and have been blatantly dishonest in their dealing with Taiwan and other countries. What I detest with the UN is that it is far from being a democratic body. When we have a Security Council of Five, who can turn things on its head when it does not suit them. China and Russia tends to veto every decision that does not benefit their country or suit them. How can this be a democratic body as far as decision making is concerned? It almost looks like a huge business organization. Charles Horner in Rising China, who wrote Rising China and Its Modern Fate, writes, Mozambique, once known as Portuguese East Africa, has become part of what Howard French described as China's second continent, a place on the way to being absorbed into greater China by huge amount of Chinese money and more than a million Chinese immigrants. This is the plan for them. We will give you money, but you must ac accept as many of our people as possible so that later we have control. Is that Louis and Theo R. King's plan for St. Lucia in the visa affair? French was correct because the reality is there. The rest of Africa is beginning to suffer the same fate, especially in manufacturing, etc., causing even higher unemployment than they had before. In Nigeria, Chinese entrepreneurs are undercutting the Nigerian traders, even in making Nigerian clothes, etc., thereby removing the Nigerian sole trader, etc. This it's creating high unemployment because the Chinese firms don't hire Nigerians. We must never forget that the Chinese are the most racist people on the planet Earth. They may not be so racist to our prime minister because he has some color. The blatant racism can be seen not too far from here in Suriname, Jamaica, Trinidad, and other countries in the Caribbean where they reside. If we, as St. Lucians, cast our minds back we will have realized that many of our Chinese neighbors today came to St. Lucia when the country had diplomatic relations with China. I therefore ask our readers, our, our, our listeners of tonight, of this, if they know of any Taiwan, Taiwanese living in St. Lucia, apart from those at the embassy, their aid has no strings attached, whereas China's aid is about control and taking over our country in a subtle manner, even as to the government or can do or not do. I therefore want our government to consider seriously whether it is worth selling our sovereignty and the heritage of our children for 30 pieces of silver. The idea of visa-free entry was not accepted and fully discussed by cabinet, as I was told, yet suddenly we hear that a decision was made. Why? I also want to ask the citizens of Viewfort whether the clock tower at the stadium has ever worked. No, it has never, and it is now dangerous and an eyesore. The Chinese workers did not know how to put it together. I was informed. Well, let me remind St. Lucians that the whole running track had to be lifted and replaced because it was a substandard track, not fit for international competition, and therefore had to be replaced for the games. It was our tiny Taiwanese friends who helped us replace the track at a considerable cost. Minister Spider Montoot can attest to that if he's honest. Not only that, a lot of maintenance work had to be done because of the dilapidated state of the stadium in order to hold the games. I have all the necessary evidence to prove what I'm saying. My research on China in 2012 and 2016 as a research fellow at the two prestigious institutions in Taiwan, looked at a period since the Tang dynasty and throughout their history, especially the two opium wars that virtually destroyed and somehow denigrated them. Further to that was the humiliation by the Japanese during the Sino-Japanese encounters that made Taiwan part of the Japanese colonial empire. Throughout their history, these occurrences have haunted them. But it has to be said that the that the Ming and the Qing dynasty were not of the Han ethnic group. 
and that they never controlled the whole of Taiwan, only part. However, history tells us that the Japanese did when they finally defeated the mountainous aboriginals, which we call the headhunters. So the idea that Taiwan is a part of China is a false claim and untrue, as far as my research and many others have shown. What is pertinent to me is that China's thrust for maritime superiority in the region and the thrust to control both the East and South China Seas is what they think will give them a certain hegemonic power to compete with the Americans. However, they are of the view that they would be far more powerful if they can unite with Taiwan. If they can do that, then they will also have control of the Pacific Ocean, including that area of the world. That is one of the reasons for wanting unification with Taiwan because it is a very strategic position. MacArthur once said that Taiwan was the unsinkable submarine. For China at present, it is all about power and control. That part of my research will be fully explained when my book on Taiwan is completed. The reason why they are breaking international maritime rules and regulations in the South China Sea is because it is, a, it is very rich in oil, minerals, and it has an abundance of fish. And with their greed, wants it all, despite six or so countries bordering those seas. Not long ago, sadness engulfed me because all the countries Taiwan has diplo had diplomatic relations with did not stand up at the United Nations as a force and say to the UN Secretary General that enough was enough, that one country cannot continue to ransom and control an institution that stands up for human rights and the rule of law, and that at this juncture, the South China Sea simply does not belong to China, that their boisterous and armed twisting influence and threats to force the UN to exclude Taiwan from institutional meetings, such as the ICAO, WHO, and the UNFRCC, See, is unacceptable and incomprehensible. Louis Abo, a former high UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and winner of the Taiwan Tang Prize for 2016, said it makes no sense for Taiwan to have a seat in the international organizations such as the ICAO, where the participation of every nation is important. China may pretend that Taiwan is not a nation when it suits them. And Mr. Louis here seemed to think so. And it's peddling this since he came to St. Lucia. Abo went on to say that Taiwan has a strong case for inclusion in organizations where international interest in universal participation is high, and that in the field of international aviation, that there could not be an exclusion of a player. She went on further to say that it doesn't make a lot of sense to use political principle or rules of, or rules or interest in keeping our partners who need to be enlisted for greater good. I concur wholeheartedly. Further to have used the diplomat David Sutton, a research analyst at the NATO Association of Canada, went further when he made a statement that when Taiwan was excluded from the ICAO meeting, that the decision was due to China's Chinese pressure and that this was against international principles and the best interests of aviation safety. This he saw as a wider campaign of pressure by Beijing to isolate Taiwan from the international community. Our PM should be aware of this. If he has a brain, so to speak, should all leaders of the world. The move, he said, violates UN spirit of developing friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights, rights and self-determination of peoples. China or any other country should not dictate world affairs on the basis of threats, particularly when it is a country to the spirit of co cooperation and constructive progress. And this is whom we are given visa-free entry to this little island of ours. We are literally selling our birthrights one of the points Sutton made, and that all Taiwan's diplomatic friends, including our PM, should take into consideration, is where he said that Taiwan's highly developed and globalized economy 
is a sizable contributor to air traffic and would affect or be affected by any changes to regulations by which it currently abides. That it is an unfortunate precedent of Beijing's unnecessary and unconstructive interference in a global regulatory body to the detriment of unified progress and cooperation. Once again, I concur with the views of those distinguished people and that the time has come when the whole world must say enough is enough to China. Therefore, I say to you, to you Mr. Louis, and to you, our king, that unless China changes its attitudes towards Taiwan, I can never support you or China in any way, least to have them in my country. I have Chinese friends whom I like very much, but not the policies of the present Chinese Communist Party. Finally, what I have since heard is that the present Chinese embassy building is being renovated expeditiously and that Mr. Louis has replaced Mr. Ming. Some have said that there is a St. Lucian policeman, policeman posted outside the establishment. Who is paying for this policeman? That's what I want to know. There are also rumors that have been substantiated that Mr. Louis is very aggressive about our relations with Taiwan to the extent he has openly said that Taiwan is not an independent country, but one that belongs to China, a renegade country, he says. He seems very angry that St. Lucia broke off diplomatic relations with China in 2006. That is an interference I don't like, and our government should ask him to refrain from this posture. I therefore said to Mr. Louis, before he starts his bellowing and belligerence about Taiwan in St. Lucia, please check his facts as he's not aware of his country's history and that of Taiwan's because he has been brainwashed as this is the way communist con con countries go about their business. Therefore, sir, let us meet so I can enlighten you and educate you in that respect. Not only that, sir, I've been told that every rope has an end and China's will come someday as it did before. Finally, I said to civil society in this country, let us wake up and begin to take action, even though some of our actions seem drastic, like beginning to put into place a viable third party to pick up the mess or to have a viable coalition government in this pristine land of ours. Many are saying to me, especially the younger generation, that they will not vote for either party, but if a new party came on the scene, they would. The time is now ripe for this group. Why? Because with remarkable speed, we are being committed to radical long-term policies, such as a DSH affair for which no one voted. At the very least, there is an understandable anxiety about what democracy means in such a context. The anxiety and anger that seems to be enmeshed in this country is that not enough have been exposed to proper public argument. Brothers and sisters, we have no choice because we have been forced to a point where we are going to have to grapple with the problems that we have been trying to grapple with since our independence, but the demands didn't force us to do so. Survival now demands that we grapple with them. We no longer cannot endure the dishonesty of governments and the way they treat us with contempt. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on to make this country one fit for our children and grandchildren to live in. Brothers and sisters in, in the one most high. All I want to do tonight is to thank God once more for allowing me to be here to plead with you and tell you that our country needs us. There will be difficult days ahead, especially the way this country is being governed, but it doesn't matter with me anymore because mine eyes have seen the glory and the coming of the Lord. And I'm assured, oh, I assure you, he has heard our cries of anguish and our pains and our anxieties. Yes, it will be difficult, but we will have a set of new leaders who care, not about party fr or friends or hangers-on, 
but those who care about the development of this country, where our children and their children will be able to live in peace and harmony with each other because of the development of the country. I know that it will come to pass because the good Lord have told me so. And I believe because he's after all the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. On behalf of Calabash Television, the admin staff, the technicians, the manager whose grandson is here, and my four children, Denise, who is here from Canada doing her first degree, beautiful Daniela, gorgeous and Princess Diane, and the prince himself, Dimitri, whom the manager has now seen, I bid you a pleasant weekend in Geova, and a good night. Good night and good night. Thank you.